All right, uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you for uh, sticking around, and thanks for um, the invite. It's been a, a pleasurable couple days, and I really appreciate it. Um, so I was trained as a population uh, geneticist in the laboratory of Brett Pesur, where I did primarily computational uh, work analyzing data, doing um, uh, simulations as a way of doing statistical inference. Uh, but if any of you know Brett, he would not be described as a naturalist. And so one of the things that I wanted to do once I went to the University of Wisconsin-Platteville, which is a primarily undergraduate institution, um, was to start to do field biology, which I had a real interest. And so upon my arrival at the University of Wisconsin-Platteville, uh, I recruited a number of highly uh, talented undergraduate students and started to work on an invasive plant that is new to Wisconsin called Japanese hop. Okay? And Japanese hop, at least in Wisconsin, is an annual species. Um, it is, importantly, a dioecious species, meaning that there are both male and female plants and male and female flowers, of course. Um, it's also, at least in Wisconsin, exclusively restricted to riparian zones. So the riparian zone is, of course, that strip of land that lies between um, the waterway itself and more upland habitats and tends to be a very nutrient-rich sort of environment due to periodic flooding uh, bringing silt to that area. And that is the kind of environment that Japanese hop, particularly in its invaded range, prefers. Um, finally, what makes it such an aggressive competitor is the fact that it is a really strong viney species that can climb up, as we'll see on the next slide, over species, outcompeting them, um, covering them with shade, uh, and eventually displacing the native plant community. Um, sorry. In terms of its position um, within the angiosperms, um, it belongs to the genus Humulus and is within uh, the really small family of Cannabaceae, which has just two genera. Its sister species is Humulus lupulus, which is common hop used in beer production, of course. Um, and then the sister genus to Humulus is Cannabis. So this is a small but very happy family, lots of beer, lots of dope, and there is, nevertheless, this one outlier, this black sheep in the family, which is um, Japanese hop. Okay, so in this image here, on the left-hand side, what we see is a very important native plant um, in the upper Midwest, which is um, uh, bee balm, which is attractive to a lot of native pollinators, including hummingbirds um, and a variety of hymenoptera. And in that picture, you can see this viney climbing of that native plant by Japanese hop, um, you know, with one of the leaves up here starting to overtake that plant. And it doesn't take very long from the initial establishment of, um, you know, a few founder plants, really, as we've seen, about two years, um, to go from that, a founding plant, to what we see on the right-hand side, which is just this dense thicket where the entire native plant community has been displaced by a dense um, number of individuals of Japanese hop. Okay? So it is a very, very aggressive invader. Um, just to give you a little bit of geographical context, um, what is shown here, the orange dot is our home, or my home university, the University of Wisconsin Platteville. And the Wisconsin DNR first identified Japanese hop uh, in 1999, at the yellow point in this graph, uh, just four miles southwest of our campus. What is actually shown in all of these blue lines, this dendritic network, is perennial rivers in what we call the driftless area of the upper Midwest. So the last major glaciation that ended about 11,000 years ago um, came down, it was actually called the Wisconsin Glaciation, and stopped right here. And so this land was all flattened up there, but then the driftless area is sort of famous for being this bluffy, um, very um, curvaceous kind of landscape where we have a lot of perennial rivers. And of course that means, right, that there are a lot of riparian zones that go along with that. So there is great potential then for this particular species because it is a riparian species to invade these networks of river over time, okay? Um, so 
one of the things that we first did, uh, my undergraduates and I, was to uh, go around rivers in Wisconsin and adjoining states and try to get a better picture of the geographic extent of this particular invasive species. The Wisconsin DNR had documented its first appearance in 1999, which was um, right at this point here in uh, figure B, this gray dot. Um, but they really hadn't done a lot of work after that to, uh, again, establish the geographic um, extent of this plant. And so we went to initially bridge crossings and then used waders and kayaks to try to get a sense of where the plant actually was. And so since 1999, this was done in the summer of 2004, we were able, sorry, 2014, we were able to, um, shown in orange, document areas where there were infestations of this plant. And at least in southwestern Wisconsin, um, these positions um, were on the Grant River, um, the Little Platte River, which is where the initial source population was, and then two discrete clusters along the Pecatonica River. Now one thing to note is that where I have colored it orange, that does not mean that you have wall-to-wall -wall Japanese hop. Rather, that means that there are clusters along those positions in the river, okay? And in fact, if we look at the uh, panel B here and zoom in on region four, and again, this gray circle right here is where the initial introduction was. Uh, if you go far enough upstream, okay, or far enough downstream, you stop seeing the plant, okay, which is really supportive of this idea that there was a human-mediated dispersal event. We know there was a construction project going on in 1999 in that area um, that was mid-river placing the seeds there, and then they were dispersing up and downstream. Okay? And that's going to be important for um, what I talk about next. Really, our, our goal is to establish Japanese hop as a model um, system for the study of the genetics of range expansion. Right? Um, and a primary reason why this is, I think, a great system for this is that there actually have been very few empirical studies that have looked at um, range expansions, recent range expansions in progress. And a good reason for that is if you have a terrestrial species, right, um, say an animal or a plant terrestrial species, it's very hard as it's spreading in all directions to actually document, you know, where is the frontal wave of expansion, right? But because this species is restricted to riverways, it's very easy to go back year after year, document where its you know, frontal range is and see how that expands over time. So we think in time, as we go back um, to these rivers, we will be able to collect samples and really get a good idea of uh, range expansion in this particular species. Now what we've done so far is um, collected hundreds of, hundreds of tissue samples from plants along riverways, not only in Wisconsin, but in neighboring states that are potential source populations um, for the Wisconsin populations. Uh, we've started to do some microsatellite uh, cross amplification from um, common hops, but ultimately we want to get uh, more genetic data, although not um, the, at the levels that we have seen um, you know, in most of the talks that uh, have come before mine. Um, so what I really want to share to with you today is um, the results of some spatially explicit simulations um, that give us an idea of what we can expect and allow us to see sort of what the power is that we'll have with a more limited uh, genome-wide data set. Um, the questions that we're particularly interested in with these spatially explicit simulations, number one, a few terms, when these plants that are around water drop seeds into the riparian zone that get washed in during a flooding event, or they drop directly into the water, those seeds are then distributed um, by the water downstream. So that is called hydrochory, waterborne dispersal, an exclusively downstream dispersal mechanism. But zochory, on the other hand, is animals moving seeds both up and downstream, which we expect to be more limited in scale, uh, but nevertheless, is, you know, we have these two opposing kind of forces, right? The dominance of hydrochory and then zochory, a somewhat less frequent event moving seeds up and downstream. And so that tension we want to look at in simulations and try to get an idea of how that affects patterns of neutral genetic diversity. Um, second of all, can we use, and again, 
probably not a phrase you've heard in a while, but small genomic data sets were paupers at my school. We, we have virtually no money, so we're trying um, to do things in a small way. But because of the recency of these events, there are there's likely to be strong signals, right? And so we can probably get by with using small genomic data sets. So we want to use these simulations to see if that's true. Um, then another question of interest is pioneer sites, right? So when a seed or a number of propagules make their way down or upstream and start to found a pioneer population, over time, how does genetic diversity change in those founding populations? And then finally, if I have time, I'd like to talk, talk about something called spatial selection, um, which is kind of a misnomer. It's actually a neutral process, unfortunately, called spatial selection. And if we get to that, I will uh, tell you what that's all about. A little bit of the, the details of these simulations. Um, you know, they're spatially explicit, but they are abstracted, of course, to some extent. So we're dealing with a linear river system, okay? And it's a three cell by thousand cell matrix where the two outer rows in brown up there are the riparian zone, and then the middle strip is the water itself, okay? And each simulation starts actually with the previous simulation, a coalescence simulation of a panmictic population. We draw 25 random samples from that and place them right in the middle at cell 500 of that stream and then let things evolve, okay? Um, when male plants disperse their pollen. We model that as a symmetric bivariate normal distribution um, so they can broadcast in all directions. And then for seed drop, not seed dispersal, but when the seed drops from the female plant, we also use for that um, another symmetric bivariate normal distribution, but with a much smaller variance uh, just because these are not going to be wind dispersed seeds. They're just gonna drop to the ground pretty near to where the parent plant is. Now, if the seed actually does drop into the water, then the simulation invokes hydrochory, and we have to simulate how far downstream does that seed travel before it gets, you know, exits onto the riparian zone. And so for that, we're using what I'm called, calling a folded Cauchy distribution. Um, so this has a high density near zero, meaning that most seeds in the water are gonna float a relatively short distance. Um, but there is appreciable probability that there will be long distance dispersal events, right? Float far downstream. If the seed, when dropped by the female plant, lands somewhere in the riparian zone, then there's an appreciable probability, which we can control, of zocori. So examples, rabbits eating seeds, pooping them out up or downstream. Um, humans carrying seeds on their shoes or again on their equipment, moving them up and downstream. And in this case, we use a true Cauchy distribution where, again, the density is centered on zero, so most incidents of Zocori are going to be local, but many of them are also going to be long-distance dispersal events. Okay? Um, just a couple, one other thing. Uh, in terms of what we would ultimately like to gather in terms of genetic data, um, is using the method of genotype by sequencing. So um, restriction digests of nuclear DNA um, and then linking and doing pair-end reads. And again, we're being very conservative in these simulations in terms of the number of genetic data that, or the genetic data that we use. So we use a thousand fragments that are pair-end read, read, and that ends up in most simulations giving us just five to 10,000 single nucleotide variants, okay? So, um, when we begin a simulation, we have an autocorrelation variable that is going to lead to patchiness of the riparian zones, okay? So in black, we have areas of the riparian zone that are not conducive to growth. So if you go out onto these rivers, because of the hilly, bluffy nature of the riparian zone, what you'll often see is that there'll be a bluff on one side, no Japanese hop, and the other side is a budding farm field, right? And it's lots of sun, and you get Japanese hop, right? And also then in gray, in shades of gray, what we see are just different nutrient levels. So the plants in these simulations can grow anywhere where it's not black, but different shades of gray mean that it can be more difficult for them to grow or to not grow, okay? And then on the two um, side graphs, we show, or I'm showing two runs of simulations, okay, for 15 years. And 
what we see is that although we've used the exact same parameter values, um, these are abundance and occurrence graphs. So remember that the carrying capacity is 15. Cells that are yellow are at carrying capacity. This is really a heat map. Cells that are at lower shades of orange are not yet at carrying capacity. And we see the variance between these two simulations, as we should. They're stochastic simulations. Um, but what is similar between both of them is the fact that the plants were introduced at this white line right here at cell 500. And hydrochory, again, is this dominant dispersal mechanism establishing plants much more in the downstream direction than in the upstream direction. Okay. So getting to um, some genetic data. One of the things that's important to us because establishing this will allow us to have reference points for these rivers is identifying the um, original position at which propagules landed and started to then spread upstream and downstream along a riverway. And so, you know, we were contemplating several very complicated ways of doing this. But when you look at just a simple plot of river position on the x-axis against on the y-axis, um, genetic diversity as measured by pi or nucleotide diversity, um, you see very clearly that at site 500 where there was the initial introduction, you have maximal genetic diversity. Um, you have a much lesser decline in genetic diversity in the downstream direction, again, due to that um, dominance of hydrochory continuously replenishing um, riparian areas with new seeds and therefore new genetic variation. Although um, I would note that although genetic variation is starting to become similar, particularly after 25 years, the makeup, the allele frequencies are very different between those newly established populations and the original source population. If we look um, following the regression lines that are in orange in the upstream direction, we see a much harder crash in genetic diversity. Okay. Again, makes sense. Zocori is expected to be uh, a, a much more limited mechanism of dispersal. Okay. Uh, and that we do observe that in the field. The further upstream you go, the less and less common this plant becomes. Okay. Um, but you might ask, you know, one introduction Obviously, that's the simplest scenario. So I don't want to get crazy, but I'll take it one more step, okay? And imagine that we have two introductions from the same panmictic population, okay? At cell 250 and cell 500. And this is relative genetic diversity on the left-hand side after 15 years of simulation, okay? And you can see it's, it's rather noisy. You notice peaks, of course, but uh, it's not nearly as clear as the single introduction. But if we take a moving average of genetic diversity across windows of river position, which is shown in this orange line here, the two maxima, the two local maxima that are greatest are in fact at those points of introduction at 250 and at 500. But still, you might ask, and you would be right, um, what about, you know, one of these lower peaks? Couldn't that be another source population or another um, introduction from another source population, I could say, right? We can combine this genetic analysis, or, or sorry, this nucleotide diversity analysis with a simple neighbor joining tree. So I'm going very old school here, and hopefully you'll be okay with that. Um, but if we look at all of the plants in the cluster, under that peak of that local maximum, all of the plants cluster together as a paraphyletic group with the one plant that is outside here from cell 250. So because of the recency of this invasion, and even though we're using small genomic data sets, um, we're actually able to quite easily, at least in simulation world, identify um, the origins of different clusters of plants along the river. Okay. Moving on to this idea of um, pioneer sites. Okay. So this is actually an empirical example. Um, this is a plant that we discovered in the summer of 2015, which was about a mile and a half upstream of the previous summer's most um, upstream extent that we had found. Now, obviously, we could have you know, missed sites. This wasn't a completely comprehensive um, examination. But here definitely is a pioneer site. It's a, 
a plant that is in the middle of no other plants of its kind, very lonely, but can eventually establish, right, potentially a population that flourishes. And that's another thing that we're interested in looking at through simulations. How does this genetic variation change over time at a pioneer site? So if we look at just one example of this from um, one simulation, uh, what we have are these occurrence abundance graphs along the river at years 8, 10, 15, and 25 since the initial introduction at what I'm calling and circling with the magenta rectangle there, the reference population. Okay? And then at year 18, so this leftmost graph here, we start to see this blinking on of a sink population with just a few plants. Okay? And as we go forward in time, that sink population begins to flourish, and by year 15, and especially by year 25, um, it has become completely full at carrying capacity. Okay? So if we then look at the allele frequencies relative to that original reference population in the sink population at this pioneer site, um, we see something interesting, I think. Um, so first of all, what is being shown in these pie charts is taking all of the loci in the reference sample where the minor allele frequency is less than 0 0.5, 0 0.05, sorry, um, and then comparing that to the frequency in, of those same alleles in the sink population. And when the pioneer site is first established, we see a classic example of a founder effect. The vast majority of these alleles have either been completely lost, these rare alleles in the reference population, or they have been at least reduced in frequency relative to the reference population. And then we have, and this is related to the phenomenon of allelic surfing, we have these um, very small number, about 5% of individual alleles, where there actually has been a dramatic increase Right? And that's just the founder effect. If you have a seed that happens to have sampled a rare allele, right, that seed now puts that frequency up to 100%. Right? And so you get those rare alleles that become actually very common alleles in the population. Um, but as we move forward, what we see is that over time, we start to expand these two categories, these two classes of differences in allele frequencies that were not present initially when the sink population was actually established. Okay? So these are alleles where in the sink population, um, they are either somewhere between, in these two gray shades, between zero and 20% greater in frequency than the reference population. And again, that is because even though this is a site that has been a founder site, it is continuously replenished by um, seeds from upstream, and so new alleles are coming in all the time. And so that, and this is the last thing I'll say before I stop, that even though genetic diversity recovers downstream over time, these sites all along the downstream axis, right, are, you know, have very different evolvability. They have very different allele frequencies relative to the original founding population at cell 500. And so we could really see an array of different clusters of populations that have very different um, potentially uh, things that become phenotypic effects, right? Um, I don't have time to talk about um, spatial selection, so, which is a, well, it's a bummer for me, probably not for you, it's pretty late in the day. Um, yeah, cane toad, <laughs> right? Um, but I did just want to briefly mention my undergraduate students. Um, I treat them kind of like, well, I treat them sounds weird. I, I consider them to be um, sort of a super organism. We don't have grad students, right? And so over the years, even though I've only been there three years, people are rotating in and rotating out, and they do the work of one grad student. Uh, and so I'm very appreciative of, of all of them in particular. And again, thank you for the invitation. Questions? <laughs>
So you, you talked about this one introduction. Are there, are, is there only one place in, in, around you where this original introduction happened, or are there multiple introductions? Um, so as far as we know, and the, the record is really spot, oh my god, I must roll this off the, <laughs> let's roll this off the stage. That would have been exciting. Um, um, we know of one putative introduction, and it re in that case, it really does look like a, tr a true introduction because, again, as you go upstream, it gets spottier and spottier. Um, the downstream density is, is more dense. Um, one reason that there may have been more than one introduction is that the Grant River, which is a separate river, has an even more abundant distribution, and it's hard to imagine that that wasn't started earlier. Um, but again, once we get these genetic data, that is definitely something we're going to try to tease apart between these diver, different river systems. Okay. All right. All right, thank you.